Welcome back to the Line Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. This is a place that we bring together the world's leading experts in all things health and wellness to help you optimize your mind, body, and movement. Today's beautiful episode is with my good friend, Dr. Mike Ruscio. He is a doctor of naturopathic medicine. He also has a history in manual therapy. So he's also a doctor of chiropractic. So I really enjoy getting to have conversations with him because he has a very diverse pragmatic perspective on what the heck is going on with the health of our body. This conversation gets into all things gut health. So the gut brain connection is the big thing. How do the microbiota, those little creepy crawly bugs that are existing in the trillions inside of our gut impact the way that we think, the way that we feel, and how in turn does the way that we think and the way that we feel impact the constitution, the state, the health of that ecosystem that exists within us. So I am super excited to share this conversation with you guys. I hope you get a lot out of it. Per mention, Dr. Mike is a good friend. So this is a very casual conversation. And we're also getting into a whole wild, wacky breadth of different wormholes. So enjoy the ride. I hope it is supportive for the state and the function of your gut, of your mind, of your body, and of course, of your movement. Here we go. Back to the program. With Dr. Mike Ruscio. Here's why I think this is where the future is going. You'll be able to be more productive as voice search improves. You'll be able to be far more productive because you'll, you'll be able to be washing a dish and say, Hey, Google, can you order, you know, another thing of toilet paper or, or, you know, whatever it is. Yep. And you'll just be able to take another point of interfacing with technology out of the equation. So that's why I'm trying to just go there because that's where I see the future going. And that's when we'll be probably just having sex with the robots on the internet. And, mm, you know, finally. It's, 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 a, it's a double-edged sword for sure. But um, I wonder at what point efficiency becomes a burden to our biology. Sure. It's a great question, and I've, I've thought a lot about that because think about all this technology that's supposed to give us more time, yeah. and people seem like they have less time. So there seems to be a, a paradox there. You could counter-argue that we're, people have a higher standard of living than they used to, which I would agree with that, but I look around, and it seems like, like you were talking about your friends from uh, Bend, from Bend, who are more available and they're also using less technology. So there seems to be this parallel between technology use and having less free time. It might be because people who are using technology more are trying to achieve more, meaning they're in you know, different industries that require or that are more competitive. So yeah, I've thought a lot about this and I'm not, I tie myself into knots. So I'm not really sure what the optimum balance point is there. Well, with, I was listening to Alan Watts, who I've like referenced on here, you know, wait, way too many times probably getting old but he's one of the things that i heard him mentioning recently was the 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 western affliction of more is you, know, you, you could perceive it as a, as a like a mental disorder in a sure. sense because yeah. if that's if that's your your os your operating system is you're just set to more yeah you'll never arrive there and sure. so now you you have this ongoing sensation of you know lacking and then you're just, you're just continually spinning your, your wheels. Where that comes back to you is I wonder how our mental, emotional relationships spill back into impacting the, the, the constitution and the state and the composition of our, uh, the bugs that exist within us. Mm. And, you know, and gut dysbiosis and mm. irritable bowel syndrome and to all bring, those things. To bring it's the like, gut into the, into the topic. So sure. if you would talk to like yeah. one of your people, and they're coming in with gut issues. I think a, a really common question would probably be like, "How's your levels of stress? And sure. what are you eating? And what are environmental conditions?" And you know, but sure. I think it's an interesting thing to draw a, a connection between, or maybe there maybe there is none. But I, I wonder what that connection or that relationship is between the thoughts and perceptions and ideas streaming through our, our mind, wherever that exists. Maybe our mind exists in our in our yeah. gut, and uh, that relationship to actually the composition thereof. Yeah, it's hard to dissect all the multitude of components of stress and, and ways people could be stressed out. But there are some studies that have taken students and surveyed them before exam stress 
and you'll see dwindling of healthy populations of bacteria in the gut during exam stress. Interesting. But, Which might not be a bad thing per se. Yeah, I mean, it's likely an adaptation. And like with stress, you can likely recover stronger. Fasting has also been shown to actually be beneficial for the gut. Oh, why do you think that would be? Pre-exam stress, what's, what's like the, the road to that having, yeah, having an effect? that's a great question. And I, I don't know that I, I have a good mechanism to offer for why that is, other than just look more broadly. Stressors, when loaded appropriately, lead to the organism recovering to be more resilient than it was before, right? You can only lift five pounds, so you lift five pounds until it hurts, and then you can start lifting seven pounds. So there, there seems to be stress, I guess, is, is really a signal to the host that it needs to be able to handle that stress, and then it adapts to be able to handle that stress. So exam stress, I'm assuming if it's loaded the right way, and we could actually use exercise as a proxy for that. Exercise also has an impact on the gut microbiota. Too much exercise actually leads to bacterial overgrowths and symptoms. But the right application of exercise has been shown to reduce IBS symptoms. Mm. So it seems there's always that Goldilocks. I mean, within reason, I wouldn't say eating Twinkies is a good hormetic stressor. But with healthy stressors, there's that balance point. And if you can get it right, then you recover more strong than you were before. How many people are dealing with some level of gut dysbiosis or leaky gut or things of the sort? Starting off with some stats, about 10 to 15% of the U.S. population has IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And that's got a little bit of a narrow diagnostic criteria. There's usually abdominal pain accompanied by alteration of bowels, constipation, diarrhea, or an oscillation between the two that's been occurring for a number of months. So that's up to 15% of the population. If you look at what's called functional gastrointestinal disorders, which is kind of this broad umbrella that you can put IBS underneath, you can put reflux underneath it, you can put gastritis underneath it, that's up to 40% of the U.S. population. Hmm. But there's also these people who have gut problems that are only manifesting with their brain, with their skin, with their joints. And this isn't a contentious statement. We know, as an example, some people with celiac disease will only have neurological manifestations. So they have a gut problem, but they're not having the reflux, the IBS. They're only having brain fog, depression, anxiety. So if you lump on top of this base of 40% of people who have some type of gut problem manifesting as a gut symptom, and then you include the people who have depression, brain fog, anxiety, skin problems, or joint pain from a problem in their gut that's not manifesting as a gut symptom, I would think it's going to be over 50% at least. So I think you could argue one in two people probably have something going on, Hmm. at least. So it's very strange that the body functions in that way. And you see this from a musculoskeletal perspective as well, which I guess that's kind of what we're talking about, where viscerally speaking, if you have some type of issue with your liver or your, you know, your, your, your stomach or your, you know, whatever the organ, those sites don't have sensory receptors to be like, oh man, like my gallbladder, it feels kind of achy. Right. And so the, the mechanism in which that system kind of will, will jump into some other system in the body to flare up a signal saying something's yep. going on yep. is I don't understand it. <laughs> but it's really interesting. It is very interesting. And, and I mean, I lived this. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if we've discussed how I got into this field in college, playing lacrosse, feeling damn near invincible, right? Until all of a sudden I started having crippling insomnia, depression, brain fog. And I turned around and said, like, what the heck is going on? Because I was doing all the stuff, right? I was eating slowly praying before I ate my food. This was, I was doing a lot of education with, with Paul Check, and oh, you know, cool. they, they really harped on um, you know, connection with your food, slowing down, eating slowly, parasympathetic. Uh, so I was getting enough sleep, eating all organic, exercising. I loved what I did. You know, I wasn't like a college student who was binge drinking five nights a week and then started to fall apart. Right? I, I, I was doing all the stuff, and I ended up, um, well, finding out later that I had a parasite that was driving all that. And Mm. for me, 
this amoeba, amoeba histolytica, which is definitely a, a pathogenic organism, wasn't causing diarrhea like it typically does. It was causing all these symptoms outside of the gut. And this is likely for a couple of reasons, but the main one is because you have the highest density of immune cells in your small intestine that you do in your entire body. So your entire body, the highest density of immune cells is in your small intestine. And when you understand that the immune system is, is the main instrument of producing inflammation, that's where you tie this all together. Because hmm. if the small intestine isn't healthy, all those particles are triggering the immune system. And the immune system uses inflammation to clean everything up. If you were to think of an immune cell as, as a cop, his gun would shoot inflammation. That's the instrument through which you're like, get out of here, we don't want you. The bullets would be inflammation. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But the problem is, that, you know, there's, there's casualties, right? Like what happens when there's a shootout? Sometimes people get killed who shouldn't get killed. Mm. That happens in the body as this inflammation goes systemic. Or the gun could get stuck and all of a sudden it's automatically continuing to shoot. Yeah, and that would be more like autoimmunity, yeah. right? So yeah, a lot of this comes down to how the gut is so connected to the immune system and how the immune system produces inflammation. And, and that's how you end up with brain fog, joint pain, skin problems that are coming from the gut. So honing in on those specific conditions, joint pain for people that are doing all the myofascial releasing and foam yeah. rolling and... Very salient for this and, audience, yeah. Yeah, uh, for, for that, how often... And I, I know that that's the case with so many people where you're like, you're just spending countless hours just drilling your tissue and right. to, to no avail. Or maybe you might get like a temporary analgesic effect where it's like, okay, it feels a little bit better, but then yeah. you're right back to Absolutely. where you were Absolutely. in three hours or, you know, one day or which whatever. I've had, maybe. Which I've had also, yeah. Most people listening, I'm sure, have had that experience where you're like, cool, yeah. I, I whack it, it's temporary. Good for a little bit. Yeah, it feels good for a little bit, and then, yeah. and then you're right back. So what percentage of the time do you think there is some level of a, of a, a gut conversation there? And how do you determine whether there, there is or is not? And if there is, how does one approach that? Well, it's hard to say um, because I, I try to be careful about just giving. Yeah, of course. You know, I see clinically because that's so littered with bias. Yeah. And even though in the clinic, I really try to be methodical about changing one variable at a time so we can get a good read. And that's one thing I, I think at least the field of integrative medicine could do a better job with is, you know, people come in and. They go on an elimination diet, fish oil, curcumin, probiotics, glutathione. Do you feel better? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we threw like six things at you. Yeah. Maybe if we slowed down, we could determine that 80% of that benefit came from the elimination diet. And so now we only need to start there. So it's hard to answer that question w with an actual percentage. But there is kind of a sequence you can follow to suss that out. I would start with the things that you preach, you know, diet and lifestyle, make sure that you're not sitting all day and eating garbage food. Or examining the way that you sit. Yeah. Because yeah. sitting is perfectly human and healthy and sure. natural. So nuances within that, right? But making sure that, that these foundational items of diet and lifestyle are where they should be. Yeah. You know, moving the right way, sitting the right way. And you have all those things within the realm of reasonable and you're still having chronic joint pain, then there's a pretty good likelihood that it's coming from your gut. So what exactly in the gut is, is driving that could be a range of food reactivity. As an example, nightshades will cause joint pain for some people, things like tomatoes, eggplant, and I am one of those people. And I will occasionally have this really annoying low back kind of ache, and it took me a while to figure out, man, when I have a bunch of tomatoes, the next day I always have that ache. So I just don't eat a lot of tomatoes um, and this is something that's been published in, in the RA literature, rheumatoid arthritis, is that a nightshade elimination diet will remove what triggers this weird kind of transient joint pain for some people. So that's just one example of how something simple, finding out what few foods may trigger you and changing that could be the difference between a year and a half of you just you know, whack a mole around trying to figure out what's the structural problem yeah. and finally bullseyeing and figuring out that it was just a food intolerance. If issue. someone, they want to go the most cost-effective way possible, they don't just have endless amounts of, of income to just throw at testing, 
what's like the gold standard to get them started to give them the information that they need to determine whether they do have some type of gut issue that's correlated to their, their joint stuff? The value of testing is appallingly overstated in the field. Mm. You know, I spend 30% of my time in the clinic talking a patient out of a test they think they need because of all the stuff that they've read, which is oftentimes people trying to sell books or supplements or tests. So I wouldn't recommend people actually start with any testing. You can start with elimination. An elimination diet is yeah. a really good place to start. So a paleo-like diet is a great place to start. And you're tracking only, food. Do you have people write it down? I don't think people need to go to that extent. Um, most people will see a pretty sharp drop off in compliance when they go into tracking specific foods or kind of punching everything into chronometer, but just giving them the avoid these foods, focus on these foods. And that's, that's enough that gets you in the, in the ballpark and you only need three or four weeks there. And then you can try the nightshade bit. This is encapsulated in the autoimmune paleo diet protocol, which I'm sure you've probably yeah, talked yeah. about at some point. And that's only a few weeks also. And what's important is sometimes people think you have to be, you know, they, they hear about this diet, let's say it's gluten-free or slow carb. And they, you know, they listen to a few podcasts, they read a few blogs and it's like, oh, this is a diet, this is really going to help me. And they're doing it for like six months and they're barely seeing any results. And they're like, well, you know, I know help is just around the corner <laughs> any day now. Things are going to turn around and get better. For the most part, if a diet is the right diet for an individual, you're going to see movement, improvement, not necessarily complete resolution within the third, fourth week. What's nice about that is then it allows you to say, okay, I'll do a few weeks on, let's say, regular paleo just as a starting point. And if my joint pain is still there, I can try going further to the autoimmune paleo protocol. And that's a good kind of one, two. The other thing that's worth trying, I mean, knowing that most people listening to this are, are probably healthy eaters, would be low FODMAP. FODMAPs are these compounds and foods that are rich in prebiotics, which, which feed bacteria. And this is stereotyped as being good, like feed your gut bugs, that's good. But it's not always good. And for some people, it actually takes a syndrome of imbalance or overgrowth and just pours gas on that fire. And you can fairly easily look up a low FODMAP list, which essentially takes fruits and vegetables and breaks them out to, here's the high FODMAP foods, try to scale back and nose a little bit. And here's the low FODMAP foods, try can to spell, steer can you more into it? those. Yeah, F-O-D-M-A-P. Yeah. Um, and same thing there. Three, four weeks on that, you should be getting a clear signal that it's, that's, that it's helping. Again, not everything will be resolved in that three to four week period, but you'll at least have a signal of this is helping, yes or no. And then if it is, ride that out until you feel like you plateau. And that's a great place to start from the perspective of figuring out what foods will work well for your gut. And people could just look up FODMAP foods. Yeah, they can look up my name and, and FODMAP um, what we've, and the reason I don't mean to be just promoting me there, but no, you're what, here. what confuses some people when they look up FODMAP is they go, oh my God, there's, you know, four different FODMAP diets and none of them match. And that's because you'll have some people from the paleo community who take the core FODMAP diet and they throw out the foods that are not paleo compliant and they don't disclose that. Mm. So we made a paleo low FODMAP diet a standard low FODMAP diet and a vegetarian low FODMAP diet so people can kind of navigate them without all the confusion. The standard right. would be the broadest. The paleo low FODMAP would be the, the low FODMAP plus some paleo restrictions. And then the vegetarian obviously would, would be. Uh, so if a person does, you know, they really like broccoli or cauliflower or whatever the things they like that's, that's you know, off the FODMAP list. Is there something that they could do? Could they steam it or could they do some to ferment it or something yeah, where all question. of a sudden it's, it comes back into the okay zone? Yeah. Uh, so there, there's kind of two ways of thinking about this. One would be a, a short-term decrease of consumption so that you can rebalance and then people can typically tolerate a lot more FODMAPs once they've got through that rebalancing phase. It's almost like saying... If you injured your ankle and you can't sprint today and you're doing this, you know, kind of a ballistic movement avoidance now, 
it doesn't mean you can never sprint again. It's just like a temporary rehab and then you'll be back on the field. Um, so one is just keeping in mind, you'll be able to get back to some degree of consumption. And to your point, which is an excellent one, things like steaming, sauteing, uh, cooking, fermenting will help many people be able to better digest fruits and vegetables to some extent FODMAP. It's because it's not always the FODMAP content specifically for some people, just the roughage bothers them. And this is something that was really brought forward by some of Elaine Goschel's work with the SCD diet. But the long short of it is a raw piece of broccoli is much harder to digest than something that's really well steamed or sautéed or whatever. Yeah. What is the SCD diet? That's the specific carbohydrate diet, which is also a good diet. I just, after using all these different diets for several years in the clinic, I've kind of settled in at, at you know, the first kind of um, fork in the road would be paleo or low FODMAP and have people kind of try either direction. Yeah. And then from there, autoimmune paleo. And if people aren't getting benefit after that, then I'm thinking there's some type of dysbiosis or overgrowth in the gut. And now we come in with things like probiotics or other supports because that's, you know, that's really like the issue at that point. It's important not to try to kind of force a dietary solution for too long. Because then people end up on these crazy, well, I'm low carb, I'm low histamine, I'm low FODMAP, I'm AIP, I'm low salicylate, and I'm low oxalate. And it's like, geez, yeah. like it's a, the diet is ridiculous. And if you get down into that level, usually there's something else going on in the gut. Sometimes I wonder, has it been, I don't know if empirically confirmed is like too, is if that's the appropriate language or if that's too like pretentious, but my basic dietary suggestion for myself if there was like an align diet nutrition yeah, diet sure. whatever it would essentially be like an exclusion diet of what i deem to be bullshit which I'm, we probably fall into similar camps of like what is and is not bullshit right. so it'd be like you know hydrogenated oils and artificial food coloring yeah. and like generally speaking most of the things on the back of you know a, some processed cereal box that you're just like what is that would probably be like, that's probably just in the bullshit category. 100%. And if it doesn't have, you know, I apologize for vegans or vegetarians, but if it doesn't have a face and it didn't come from a really healthy, vibrant background, it doesn't have, like, I, I'm more interested in the sourcing and the origin of food, whether yep. it's a, a vegetable or a fruit or an animal or whatever it is, but it doesn't have a face, which is weird to say. I don't, you know, I don't really actually like saying that, but that, or it didn't actually grow out of the ground, sure. um, then it's, it's very likely you know, a little dubious in like the aligned nutritional code. But I wonder how much of that is just fits my, my kind of perfect model echo chamber story and how, mm. and my own, you know, my, just my bias from everyone kind of saying the same thing. No, there, there, is, there is data to support that. I mean, to maybe reiterate that, you know, more in the framing of, of how it's been studied, at least to my knowledge. And maybe the best study I've seen on this is the... Diet Fits trial by Christopher Gardner, who's over at Stanford. And what he wanted to do was pit like a lower and a higher carb diet against one another. But what had happened in some of the prior research is the higher carb diets, they were, they were kind of like these, these crappy carbs mm -hmm. and they didn't make enough delineation. And, and I think one of the things Gardner had learned through some of the excellent research he's done over the years is if you don't give people on a higher carb diet some confines, they drift into the kind of food that you're describing, which is processed food. Yeah. And so when they controlled for food quality, which is really, I think, the essence of what you're saying, when it's yeah. good quality food, they found that the, the difference between diets came down to almost nothing. Hmm. And you know, that seems to be something that, that there's pretty good agreement on. When, when you get past like all the different camps, like you know, vegetarian versus paleo versus Mediterranean versus low carb, that is kind of like arguing over the 20%, but the 80% foundation is really just food quality, food sourcing. Yeah, that's, and that's the only thing that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Like and that, all of that the other conversations, yeah. I'm fully neutral. Like I'll have right. any carnivore or vegan or yeah. anybody on here and just like, what's going on? What's the right. research say? Yeah. And they're all diametrically opposed. But the one consistent thread with all of them that I, that I gather is sourcing matters. Yep. Fully, fully agreed. And, and I share your your affinity for kind of this like nonpartisan dietary philosophy where I may espouse the, the paleo diet as a starting point and low FODMAP, but I kind of look at this as 
you're quarterbacking the person through finding the diet that's going to work best for them. Yeah. Meaning like maybe we'll throw it a low carb. Maybe we'll throw it a paleo. Maybe we'll throw it to vegetarian. I, I tend to recommend vegetarian much more rarely just based upon the responses that I've seen. But you know, we've made the vegetarian low FODMAP diet. So obviously we're, we're endorsing of that. You know, it, at least for me, when you're in clinical practice long enough, you see that not everyone does well on paleo. And not everyone does well on low carb and not everyone does well on high carb. And, and so you step back and you're like, okay, I'm going to ditch the dogma, meaning, you know, this, this camp's philosophy maybe appealed to me the most just because of my constitution or my proclivities. And I'm just going to try to step back and look at these diets almost like, a, a, like a, an array of different options. And how do we look for the indicators that tells us what a person's going to respond well to? If you look at them and they're coming from the CrossFit paleo camp and they're eating a ton of vegetables, it's like, hmm, you know, and they have a lot of bloating and diarrhea, like you may be eating too much FODMAP. Yeah. Or if you look at someone who says, the shittier I eat, the better I feel, it's like, well, you may be too low carb. And when you say crappy foods, you're eating like rice and other things like that. And so maybe you just need to get off of, you know, the, the bandwagon of being low carb and let's up your carbs a little bit. So you just bit. need to treat yourself like a living experiment. Yeah, if you like can, start if you controlling get, variables, start to like have some, yeah. you know, preconceived notions and philosophical allegiance tends to really hold people back, in my opinion. And it's one of the things that's really disheartening about what I see in the clinic is someone will have tripped over the signs of what they should do to feel better, but they'll purposely avoid that because they think philosophically it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. And then I talk with someone like, like me who has a high level of knowledge in all these different areas, and I explain to them, like, no, there's also good evidence supporting this. And they're like, oh, my God, like, I didn't realize I could do that. I've been avoiding that for the past two years. And then the interesting thing is, like, in, in part, the folks that are operating more inside the confines of some type of, like, tribal dogmatic dynamic they are onto something because that community layer, I think that it, it, you could yeah. break that down into being like a viable, it's like nutrition, like legit. Like I think we, Fully at agree. a cellular community level, we're, we, we, we feed on it. Community like we and We feed purpose. on the sun yeah. and we feed on purpose. And yep. like, you know, so so I, that is a challenge. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think that's why, just like you're saying, some people will end up kind of, you know, in, entrenched in, in a certain way of living. And it's not to say you have to throw all those things away, but, find out how to personalize the diet for you, if that makes sense. You could be someone who, you know, maybe you were doing low carb and now you do, you, you still kind of embody a lot of the concepts that may be coming from the lower carb community, but you're going to do moderate carb. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think you wouldn't, you wouldn't be strung up as a heretic if, if you. <laughs> so, so, so within that, is that, I try to veer away from being excessively like, like, woo metaphysical saying something airy that doesn't have any grounds to stand on. Is there any scientific data that backs the cellular impact of feeling connected to something greater than yourself? <laughs> being in a family, being a part of a, maybe like a, a religious dogma of some right. sort, going to right. church. Good question. This isn't an area that I've, I've examined too deeply, but, but there are, you know, a couple books that I've found to be insightful, um, Blue Zones by Daniel Butner, which yeah, I'm not sure you've heard of. You know, they, they talk about the more social time people have, perhaps being the, the tightest predictor of just their life satisfaction. I mean, feeling safe. If yeah. you're wrapped up in your own skin bag and you're just isolated in your apartment, just doing everything for you. Right. So this is, this is why I, I'm passionate about providing an antidote to some of the kind of really overzealous health messaging that you'll hear. And, and I think... For a lot of the patients that, that we work, work with at the center, they have uh, thyroid autoimmunity, hypothyroidism, and or digestive issues like IBS or SIBO. And there's a lot of messaging to those people that you should not eat gluten. And there is a, a kernel of truth to that, but what people come in thinking is that if they you know, have any gluten even in a sauce that they're going to like spontaneously combust. And that leads them to recluding from church or the social yeah. activities. The, or, the medicine. Or, or yeah, and, and it's really poisonous because, you know, yes, if, if you have a, a problem with gluten and this could be celiac or it could be 
non-clinical, I'm sorry, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, those people will, will fairly clearly have an experience where I eat gluten and I feel poorly. There was a, a good study by a researcher uh, at the University of Bologna that looked at about 12,000 patients and, and they found, I believe it was a 3% incidence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So the largest study that looked at this, and this was published only a couple of years ago, found a 3% prevalence. So that's something, right? It's like, that's documentable. It's not chance. It's not in people's heads. There are people who don't have full-blown celiac, but do have this non-celiac gluten intensivity that, that's reproducible and legitimate. And when a group of researchers survey 12,000 people and give them over a 60-point examination, they find this. So that's something. But it's also 3%. And so when someone comes into my office and they haven't gone out to eat for a year because they read at, you know, yeah. glutendoctor.com, uh, you know, gluten guru guy who's well-intentioned, I, I get that, but my, my passion and bit of uh, anger comes from the fact that these people will be clearly emotionally distraught because they've been avoiding gluten on faith without any clinical indication that they need to avoid gluten, but they've just been messaged over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. And that really kills community. Yeah. Right. And so that, that's one of the things where I think the, the dietary messaging is antithetical to being healthy. And then other kind of non obvious nutritional, um, resources that go into like the kind of woo metaphysical analogy of, of, Connection is like a nutrient and sunlight. I mean, sunlight is, I think, very clearly a nutrient where your body's actually able to, to, to process the energy from that into, you know, vitamin D and the whole, you know, yeah. you know like you're a, you're a battery. And there is evidence. I presented on this, I believe it was at the 2018 Ancestral Health Symposium. I, I did a presentation there entitled something along the lines of avoiding the sun is as dangerous as smoking. Mm. And I took that title idea from... And loneliness is a part of that as well. You've seen sure. that research. It's like 15 cigarettes yeah, a day. Yeah, very, very similar. So it's all the same. Yeah. It's very similar. Like, the, like the, the foundation of, I think, living, being a healthy organism, um, I think it's, it's like there's just so much low-hanging fruit. Yes. And it's that, all out that there. Cannot, and that cannot be stated enough. I, I fully agree. But, but really quick, yeah, the sorry. point I was driving at is there are some studies looking at certain diseases that only decrease when you get time in the sun and this is fully independent of vitamin D. Mm. So there's something independent mm. of vitamin D. So I mean, you can't just supplement with vitamin D that you get that's good for you only from sun exposure and not from the vitamin D supplement. That's probably to your point. so many things. Nitric, that like nitric the, oxide it's, it's like is, the, is one the, the, on, the entourage effect. Yeah. You yeah. know, so you can get a whatever vitamin C supplement, but it's not the same as having an orange. Like there's, there's all this and then the, them bound together. It's this, it's this perfect orchestra that your body's been assimilating for millennia. Yeah. If you believe in evolution yeah. and then we're extracting that in the last 10, 20, 50 years, just expecting for it to be the same thing because it's written on the bottle. Yep. But that's like crazy to think that it just works that way. Yeah. And, and that, <laughs> that process, that process, that, that reductionism is helpful, but you know, you, you can't use that model to explain everything. Everything. Right? Yeah. And it's also that evolutionary mismatch if you look at where we evolved from. And this is why I like so much of the messaging coming from the paleo community because they're harping on all these same things. Yeah. Connection, time in the sun, unprocessed food, exercise, circadian rhythms, right? Sleep patterns that are correspondent with, with sun cycles, kind of to your point. Yeah. What's your perception of people that are kind of have, have bought the idea, whether it's correct or incorrect, I'm kind of neutral. Well, I, I, have, I have my own personal opinion, but for other people, but that the, they're essentially been sold the idea that it's wise to be afraid of the sun in a way. Mm. You know, so if you're going to be out there, you got to yep. watch out because you don't, you know, the sunspots, you don't want the skin cancer. And, yep. you know, if you're going to go outside of that door and it's not like between the hours of 6 a.m. to 7.30, right. you got to get your sunblock on. Yep. Is that... Is that right? Well, there, there's many controversial topics in healthcare that you can't say it's right or wrong, but what ends up happening is there's some data points kind of in the middle that are oftentimes misconstrued. So with, with the sun, and I don't want to speak too far outside of my area of specialty, but I yeah. did spend quite a bit of time really sifting through the evidence here, 
not really caring. You know, I, I do have a bias that my framework is that the sun is healthy for you, but I'm, I'm always willing to confront a bias if there's evidence that contradicts what I think going into a research project. And in this case, I mean, yes, there, there are data that show that amount of sunburns directly correlates with skin cancer. So that's where one camp will pull from and they'll kind of cherry pick only that data. But to the credit of, of Michael Hollick and, and some of the people in his group, Michael Hollick is the guy who literally um, discovered vitamin D. What many of these studies are showing when you look a little bit further is there's also an increased risk for cancers, including skin cancers with sun avoidance. Exactly. So routine exposure to the sun, not like the Jersey Shore, because right, like people always want to argue from the extremes, which is, well, no sun at all, or other people will make the argument, well, you need sun, and, and they'll, they'll point to people who go to tanning beds and get a ton of sun exposure. But that's not what I think you and I would advocate for either. It, it would be you get in the sun maybe five to 20 minutes on most days with your skin exposed. And that does show an ability to decrease skin cancers. There is a, there is a skewing with skin type, meaning those with lighter skin are more prone to burn. Yeah. But it comes back to as long as you're not burning and, and if you kind of learn your skin type and you're getting constant exposure to the sun, meaning a few times per week, it's pretty clear that that's been shown to decrease the incidence of, of most skin cancers. There's, there's one or two wrinkles in that statement, but it nets out to a, a pretty defensible position. And so I wonder, the reason I'm, I'm asking you all this stuff that, that's kind of going, it seems disparate from the gut conversation, but I wonder how that does come back to a person that, say, is suffering from joint pain or bloating or something of the sort. Could a little bit of Shinrin, Yoku, you know, <laughs> nature bathing, like getting out and about and being exposed to some plants and petting a puppy and getting some sunlight on your eyeballs. And yeah. will that trickle back into the, the constitution of your insides? There have been a few studies that have looked at vitamin D supplementation having a, what we think is a beneficial impact on the gut microbiota. The reason why I say we think is because we're, we're still pretty early in our understanding and, and when people model out the thousand some odd bacteria you find in the stool and the ratios of all of them, we're still trying to figure out what exactly, you know, should those thousand some odd bacteria look like in terms of absolute and relative abundance. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that being said, there are a couple of studies that have found vitamin D supplementation improves the health of the gut microbiota. Vitamin D and time in the sun have been shown to decrease autoimmunity which partially comes from the gut and from the immune system. So yeah, I think it's, I mean, totally a defensible statement to say, if you're not feeling well, whatever the symptom is, joint pain, depression, start in this foundational layer yeah. of diet and lifestyle. And that's oftentimes kind of glossed over, but uh, it, I mean, that's where you really want to make sure you're nailing things. And maybe to throw in one kind of uh, oddball topic here, I'm growing increasingly concerned that there's a epidemic of people who have undiagnosed either sleep apnea or upper airway resistance syndrome, which is essentially the, the airway's a bit collapsible and at nighttime you're having this kind of lack of oxygen. So for the entire night, you're just a little bit stressed out. Mm. And if anything interferes with your sleep quality, coming back to the foundational layer, that is a massively important foundational layer. Think of it this way. You know, I'm sure you've had a night or two that you've gone to bed at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And I'm assuming you feel it the next day, just, yeah. like, just like I do. Imagine if every night, even though you were going to bed at 11, you were getting the kind of sleep as if you went to bed at 3. Sure. That's what could be happening. And when you also f look at this in the framing of 20 to 40% of people snore, and that's a huge red flag, and if people have had braces, that also throws up a, a big red flag. It makes me, um, and this is something that we're really looking into at the clinic right now, I was actually just diagnosed with mild obstructive sleep apnea via a home sleep test. And I'm excited about the prospect of this because I, I think this is one really huge piece of low-hanging fruit that if I optimize for, I might have even better energy, performance, cognition. And the way you treat this it's not just CPAP, 
or this is one thing I think conventional medicine is doing really poorly. Um, myofunctional therapists, which I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure essentially exercises for your tongue and for your lips uh, and for your throat can tone those muscles so that at nighttime when everything relaxes, you don't have that partial occlusion of the airway and this low oxygen level and therefore higher heart rate for the entire night. And that's that's a, a big piece. So um, I'm just mentioning that because it's something that as I've been looking for it, um, I'm kind of getting shocked at how common, at, at least my initial suspicion is, is that it's going to be. Yeah. What's that called? Homing, oming. There's a word you you press oh, the tongue. Uh, hearing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You yeah. press the tongue up through yep. for your mouth. You do that exercise yeah. throughout the day. And it's supposed to make you to you look. It's supposed to make you look yeah, more attractive. Your jaw structure yeah, and the whole thing. Yeah. And that's what's nice about what is it called? Muring. I think it's muring. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's just the name of the guy that yeah. that, that came up with it. Yep. Yeah. And you, are you doing any of that stuff? So I'm going to be meeting with someone. I believe it's next week. Uh, a myofunctional therapist to have an evaluation. I had a whole series of scans and essentially what they, what they found in my case was due to having braces, my, my teeth got pulled back a little bit. That's crowded my tongue. And so at, at night, especially my tongue doesn't have enough room. So it tends to just kind of slough into my throat. And I think this is something that affects a lot of people. Uh, so, Part of what I'll be doing is is getting this device. It's called the Homeo Block. It was made by yeah, uh, Ted Belfort. Yep. That's going to help expand some of those restrictions, and then I'll pair that with some myofunctional work to tone the muscles in the throat, the palate, and the tongue. And coming back to sleep, the one thing that improved my health the most, outside of just getting rid of a, a gut parasite, which is a pretty big box to check, was just my sleep hygiene. Yeah. I mean, going to bed at 10.30 as compared to 12.30, not exercising too late at night, not eating too late at night. Those just, when you want to talk about the next day, feeling like I have focus all day, that I'm sharp, not feeling like I need that, you know, midday espresso or whatever it is, sleep. I mean, it's a huge, huge lever to pull on. I want to take a quick moment and discuss a potential solution for you if you are experiencing gut issues. So if any of this conversation is resonating with you, perhaps you are experiencing joint pain, perhaps you have some type of gas or bloating or abdominal pain, or even a whole variety of different skin disorders, it may be associated to those little bugs inside of your gut. So if you all are interested in repairing that gut, we teamed up with our friends over at BioOptimal just to get you guys a 10% discount on the Leaky Gut Guardian. So you can jump over to leakygutguardian.com slash align for 10% off. So I recommend incorporating some type of probiotic that you trust. As Dr. Ruscio said, some out there are not as good as others. I absolutely stand behind BioOptimizers. The products that they make are fantastic. And this is one of the best ones that I have come across for restoring the lining of the gut. Also, other things that would be valuable would be adjusting the foods that you're eating, paying attention to levels of stress that you're experiencing in your life. All of that can spill back into the inflammation inside of your gut. So with anything, we are working from both sides. So we're working internally with the things that we're putting to our face. Leaking Good Guardian is a great option for that. And then also thinking about what's happening with the state of our environment, what's happening in our relationships, what's happening with our work, what's happening with our exposure to nature and sunlight. Might be a good idea to get a, a puppy or a dog or just spend more time outside in general because all of that will inform and develop and cultivate the livelihood and the health of your microbiome. On top of all that, get yourself some Leaky Gut Guardian. If you are not totally satisfied, if you do not experience an actual change in your health from taking Leaky Gut Guardian, then get yourself a full money back guarantee. So no questions asked. If you take the stuff, you don't notice a change, get your money back no problem. So you got absolutely nothing to lose. You got everything to gain. Hit up leakygutguardian.com slash align for 10% off. I also would like to discuss a substance that I put into my water because it tastes delicious and improves the assimilation of my hydration. So I use Element, L-M-N-T, which was founded by my friend Rob Wolf, who's someone I absolutely emphatically trust as well. 
really excellent stuff. It has a perfect balance of sodium, magnesium, and potassium, and tastes absolutely delicious. And you can get yourself a free sampler pack, which is amazing. So you can try the stuff out, get yourself a sampler pack. You got absolutely nothing to lose in this case. It's five bucks for shipping. You get yourself started, and I guarantee you're going to love the flavor and it will improve your state just by drinking one of them. If it doesn't, then, uh, you know, no big deal. You got nothing to lose. Check it out. Go over to drinklmnt.com slash align. That's drink, D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash align to try a free sampler pack of elements. I personally enjoy the chocolate salt but they're all really good. So check out the sample pack. I hope you guys enjoy it. Drinklmnt.com slash align. Pow. So we got into the joint pain business. What about a person that has an ongoing bloating experience happening where they just can't figure, they're doing the FODMAP and they're, you know, they're doing all the things, but they still have this, this extra layer Sure. And it's just like, won't go away. Well, if you run through these things in that sequence, just to kind of reiterate, all of the lifestyle stuff that we've been talking about, we talked about those couple dietary trials you can run, paleo, FODMAP, AIP. And then if someone's still having bloating, probiotics would be the next thing that I would do 100%. And with probiotics... There's a lot of confusion about probiotics, and I think this confusion emanates from the fact that a lot of the education about probiotics is coming from companies that make probiotics. And so there's kind of this incentive to have something that's new, unique, and novel. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that you know companies marketing their product is a bad thing, but what's challenging is when a company is looking for, well, what's what's good about our product? And then their competition is looking for, well, what's good about our product? Yeah. What you end up having is all these claims and you start reading and it's like, well, geez, there's a bunch of probiotics out here. What do I use? There's also some thinking with probiotics. I mean, we could do a whole podcast on this, but there's also some thinking that you need a certain probiotic species or strain for a certain condition. And there is 90% of agreement in the data that that's not the case. And I've check this from the level of the species, meaning lactobacillus acidophilus, all the way down to the strain designation. We, we've taken the research and the findings and we put them in data tables so we could do a really easy side-by-side comparison. There's not this probiotics are like drugs, so you have to use a certain species to get a certain effect. Like this is the one for constipation, that's the one for depression. But when you kind of zoom way out and you look at the literature, there's these different categorical types of probiotics. The traditional probiotic that's been around for the longest and is the most well-researched are your lactobacillus acidophilus, your bifidobacterium infantis. It's a, it's a blend of these types of species, usually about 10 to 12. And VSL-3 is a, a popular probiotic I've heard of. It's kind of one of the first probiotics in the block of that ilk. But there's also a healthy fungus, Saccharomyces boulardii. And there's a number of trials on this. And the newer kid on the block, and a lot of people in the paleo community like this probiotic or this probiotic type, is your soil base or your spore forming. So various bacillus species. Has this come on on your radar at all? Yeah, I'm familiar with it, but not deeply familiar with it. So if you look at probiotics, most formulas and most of what's been used in the research falls into one of those three categories. And so what we do is at the clinic is we have people go on all three at the same time. And the analogy that I I like to use is if if you had a stool you were sitting on, using one of those formulas or one of those categories, it's like having a one-legged stool. Like it'll support balance in your gut, but it's going to be wobbly. But if we have all three supports, that's like having three legs on that stool. It's much more sturdy. It's much more solid. It's much more conducive to establishing balance in the ecosystem and therefore resolving someone's symptoms. Mm. So I'd recommend someone find a quality probiotic from each one of the categories and use all three of them together. That may allow, in this case, the bloating to respond if they haven't seen response from just picking one up at Whole Foods or trying things like yogurt or kimchi. 
because we'll finally get them kind of that higher dose and more comprehensive kind of three legs of support. Could some of those other low-hanging fruit parts that we were discussing before, like levels of stress, exposure to sunlight, things of the sort, could that come back and impact a person bloating? I don't actually know exactly what bloating well, is. Well, so there, there's, there's bloating and there's distension. Uh, bloating technically is feeling like you have all this gas and pressure in your gut. And then the stension is visibly looking like your abdominal wall is pushed out. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, bloating could be a result of stress, right? You know, one of the symptoms that is partially encapsulated in, in IBS, although it's not a hallmark symptom, would be bloating or abdominal pain. Mm-hmm. And we do know, and there, there have been studies that have shown that sleep disruptions, as one example, make IBS worse, yeah. as does stress. Yeah. So that's why I always harp on, and I, I think about these things kind of like a pyramid. The bottom layer of the pyramid are all these dietary and lifestyle factors, of which there's many, right? And, and they're oftentimes just paid this platitudinous lip service, but you can spend a lot of time to get those things right. It's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to really have your movement and your stress and your community and your enjoyment and your food all and your sleep all dialed in. That's where you start. These interventions of kind of nuanced paleo low FODMAP probiotics, that would be the second step someone take. So what about edema? Because that's what I was, I was part, both, you know, just we've got extra stuff. We've got extra air and extra fluid and our body's just becoming a heavy. Are you asking, are you heavy... asking for a friend? Yeah. <laughs> wink, wink. Yeah. <laughs> um, edema, I don't see as much of this in the clinic and, and I haven't looked into edema as much. Edema could be, you know, from my understanding, you know, it, again, it's, it's not squarely uh, my focus. If someone's overtraining, you could see edema mm. due to, and you probably know this far better than me, um, if they're starting to have things like carpal tunnel or other kind of, you know, uh, restrictions that are limiting their circulation. Yeah. And they can also potentially develop electrolyte imbalances if they're overly stressed, especially if they're, if they're really hammering the exercise. And could exercise take on many forms? Like exercise might not necessarily just like I'm crossfitting. Could exercise be maybe, I don't know, you're a chess player and your mind is going all mm. the time or you're stressed about work or you're just, you're always on. Like your, your CNS is just always on. There's a lion in the room all the time. Could that almost be a similar conversation? I don't, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know if stress can cause edema. I do know that overreaching or, or exercising, just beating yourself up too hard can cause edema um, because th- there's slightly different mechanisms where you're, you're going to have different hormonal skewing when you have exercise stress. You're going to sweat more. That's going to change certain corticosteroid and adrenal hormone releases that impact fluid retention. Um, but again, this is an area I don't know a ton about. So Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm pushing in all these different... Yeah. I mean, I'll give you what I different, got. Different hallways. Yeah. You got more or less in different yeah. areas depending on where we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, the big thing that I'm really interested in among you know lots of things is the chicken or the egg conversation because I think it's so interesting you know the, the the gut and when we say gut are we saying stomach and intestines is that gut what is gut well the, the first part of your gut is technically your mouth um, Not the point there's not a ton of imbalances from a clinically manageable standpoint there other than potentially you know, the whole like you had braces and now your tongue posture isn't good yeah but I think the spirit of what we're talking about is more so this like inflammation, immune dysregulation, dysbiosis, and that you're going to see well, more. Well, there's all the issues that come up from bacteria in your mouth. That's why you got to floss, right? True, true. But I think most people have that fairly well dialed in. I don't know. Depends <laughs> what country you're in. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. So fair, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, isn't England stereotype? Yeah, I was going to say it, but I didn't want to. Yeah. I try to be well, PC. Yeah. There, there we go. There yeah, goes yeah. our PC yeah, uh, it's card. Not the, it's not the way to think. You said it. You said it. <laughs> um, but I think the reason why the gut proper, if you will, right, the, the stomach and mainly the small intestine is of such importance is because in the West, we don't really have the best upbringing to colonize the gut in the first few years of age. Mm. And that has an impact on the immune system. This is the whole hygiene hypothesis. I'm sure at some point you've talked about yeah, yeah. Um, And there's a balance, but we've probably gone a little bit too far in the direction of hygiene And what's interesting is it's in large part the colonization of the gut that occurs in those first few years of life 
And that then attunes the immune system. Are you going all the way back to like vaginal fluid and C-section stuff? So you have your, one of your first inoculations when you go through the vaginal canal. There are studies that have found that mothers and children who live on farms end up having less allergy and it even breaks down for a number of farm animals in contact with has a progressive benefit for reducing things like allergy and atopic dermatitis later in life. So the reason why I think there's the second step, which is after diet and lifestyle, that's the foundation. There are people who have those things where they should be. I mean, generally speaking, no one's going to be perfect, but like pass fail. Like, are you doing stuff well enough? Yes. Are you still having joint pain, depression, brain fog, insomnia? Yes. Then the next thing I'd recommend people look at is their gut because it's a fairly common causative factor and it eludes some people. They end up chasing down, well, it's adrenal fatigue or it's hormonal imbalances. And it can be, but from a probability perspective, it's much more common that it's a problem in the gut. So yes to your question, gut issues can be caused by problems with diet and lifestyle, but I'm assuming that people are going to do those things first, and then once they have a pass in that area, if they're still suffering, the one take-home I'd want people to have is look to your gut health, because it's so disconcerting when I see people who have gone and they've chased down all these red herrings. I thought it was a thyroid conversion issue. I thought... It was mold in my home. I thought it was oxalates. I thought it was adrenals. And those things all have a time and a place, but they're less probable than a problem in the gut. And it's, it's common that we'll see people who have chased those things down and not gotten the results until we start with their gut. So that, that's why I really kind of harp on that is because it just saves people from suffering and yeah. wasting money. And so the kind of more broader nebulous curiosity that I have is the gut brain relationship and how, you know, whatever we have millions of neurons interlaced throughout the gut and it's, you know, I've got this gut feeling, like what is a gut feeling yeah, in the first place? And, and what is a, if there was a, a chicken or the egg, my, my sense is most chicken and the egg questions. It's always both. It depends on the situation. Um, but do our thoughts, feelings, identity, structure, sensation of scarcity or fear or sensation of feeling safe, connected to bigger, something bigger than ourselves, family, God, like whatever, does that come back and in, inform, this is the same question I asked in the beginning, but I just want to like re, just, we wrap up on that. Does that come back and inform the actual constitution of the inhabitants of the, the microbiota that are existing in there? Or is it the bugs inform the belief systems? Oh, I see. Or is it, is it both? Is there... It's bi-directional. Yeah. It's, it's That's that. so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's definitely bi-directional. Um, but, you know, if, if you think about it, we're, we're living in this symbiotic relationship, right? So, like, if, if I was the brain and you were the gut and we were roommates, we got to get along, Right. If the agreement is I vacuum and you take it out of the trash, yeah. <laughs> like you got to do your part, I got to do my part. And if we don't, we're going to have disharmony. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way a lot of biological systems work is there's kind of this partnership between two different systems. And no one system in that partnership is, is the preeminent or, or dominating system. Yeah. But it's dependent upon um, both of them being tended to. Two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Yeah. How the heck the thoughts, feelings, all that stuff changes like the, like the, the, the examination changing the, 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 the gut bugs, you know, having, having, how did you describe it exactly? A person stressed out about a test, what happens to their, to their gut? Yeah, you'll see a reduction of certain healthy bacterial populations in the gut. How does that happen? I mean, I know that you don't know and nobody probably knows, but like, what do you think? Well, no, there's some suggestions that it could be mediated by cortisol levels or, or stress hormone levels mm. and also to some part circulation. Mm. And this might be why people who exercise too much also end up having problems in the gut is because exercise will take circulation away from the gut on, on the one hand, but exercise is also a little bit immunosuppressive. So the right dose of it is, is helpful, but I'm sure you've heard of the research in triathletes who push it too hard end up getting sick. Mm -hmm. And that's because they've gone over that optimum point, that sweet spot of exercise loading, and now they've gone into immunosuppression. So probably through circulation and through stress hormones and, and through how it impacts the immune system. 
Buddhists, the middle way. They yeah. were on it. Yeah, well, th- I mean, definitely find the sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, that's, uh, I feel like a lot of what I'm trying to do, um, maybe you feel the same way, and how I, like, advise patients at the, at the center is just trying to find that, trying to ride the wave, trying to find an optimum point of how do we keep you just cruising and feeling good? Because if you've ever ridden a wave, it's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. But then you fall, and that fall sucks. Um, but let's try to get you on the wave for as long as we can and minimize the amount of falls that you have. Because falls are going to happen. No one's going to be on the wave in perpetuity. But, um, yeah, if we can keep you on the wave for a long time and make your falls minimal and you're, you're getting back on the wave quick, then that's a good goal. And then also not getting ourselves in the double bind of judging ourselves for for falling peaking too high or dropping yeah. too low because that's, that's it's, it's those those peaks and those valleys is what gives you reference to what balance is if you didn't have those then there'd be the only way that there's a middle is is for there to be those peaks and sure. valleys and that's why i try to mention that you know the falls happen so people understand it's normal because i think like anyone else when i've had a few falls the, you know one of the first instincts i think we have is to kind of become hyper vigilant what's wrong oh my god and, and you know especially if you go on google and you start searching stuff you, you think you have cancer or something oh, like man. that really fast and also in, in a lot of healthcare conversations we're kind of showcasing like the highlight reel it's almost like going to uh instagram and watching you know the the athlete who tried to do the whatever cool like parkour thing but they don't show you the eight times yeah, that he the, fell on his face yeah, and not right. getting it. Yeah. Uh, so we tend to see just all the good stuff. I think it's important to acknowledge that there will be times when you don't feel well, and that's okay because if you're, if you're expecting to feel perfect, like you're saying, always being on that crest, you're going to beat yourself up when you're not in the crest, and, yeah. and that's not productive. It's just yeah, like, feeling okay. shitty is perfectly fine sometimes probably. Yeah. Feeling depressed, like depression's a, you know, that's a, that's a loaded word. What, what you know, just feeling generally... Uh, a malaise or feeling generally down or feeling, you know, grieving. Yeah. You know, it's like, there's nothing, there's a lot of these things I think we put into like good, bad buckets. And then you add this judgment on this thing that may or may not be biologically perfect and mentally, emotionally perfect for your expression to arrive into a more balanced place. But if we add that identification of like, okay, this sensation is bad. Sure. Maybe we're right, but maybe we're just adding a new stress into the system to juggle. You're totally right, and this is something that we'll, we'll see. It's known as limbic imbalance when people become so hypervigilant about monitoring their body for symptoms. Yeah, like orthorexia kind of thing. But, yeah. But different, that, same but different. Yeah, that, that their immune system and their emotions get really skewed. And, yeah. and let's, say, let's say tomorrow you felt a little bit bloated, right, for like right. an hour. For someone who's a little bit limbically skewed they would have a really intense and prolonged emotional response to that bloating. Mm. Worry, fear. And now we created a disease. Exactly. And that's why I try to be really good about framing these things because if we don't handle the conversation, as an example, around gluten responsibly, and we only tell people how bad gluten can be, people walk away thinking gluten's bad for everyone all the time, and then it's kind of this runaway problem. So I, I try to give people, and you've done an awesome job about asking probabilities and stats, so people can understand what risk is and, and what you may expect to um, have as a normal experience so you don't frame things incorrectly and create a problem when there is none just because you're feeling a little bit unwell. It's like a iatrogenic disease. Exactly. Yeah. And there's... And, and, what is, that? is that like number two killer, number three killer? It's high up there. It, it is high up there. This would be a different application of that because I think that's typically you know, surgical failures and, and drugs uh, reactions. And, yeah, right, you're right. It's different. But this would be kind of this integrative medicine iatrogenesis where you know, we're, we're making people sick in attempts to be healthy. And this definitely does happen, especially with... Great for selling products. Especially with all the testing that's going on out there. Yeah. Um, there's all these lab companies... And again, I want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt that they're doing it with, with good intention, but I don't think they see the person that comes into my office who's been suffering for a while and they have MTHFR, adrenal fatigue, poor thyroid conversion, you know, a food allergy test that told them they can't eat 18 things. And they're walking around thinking they're far worse than they are. And a lot of those tests aren't even helpful. Yeah. It's amazing how people will internalize that and it will negatively impact their everyday experience. More Watts stuff. Starting Watts, we had, we fin- finished with Watts. Yeah. One of the things he, barring just another bit from him, is talking about 
Uh, this might have been somebody else actually, but anyways, the idea is if I'm a therapist or I'm a doctor or I'm whatever, then by default, I need you to be a patient. Because yes. if you're not a patient, yes. then I'm don't not a make, doctor. Don't make people patients that don't need to be patients. Right. <laughs> well, well said. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so what point are we, are we just a bunch of, you know, yeah. human beings? <laughs> and that's why I try to, I honestly, I'm so glad you said that because I try to go the opposite way in the clinic you know, disclosing to people that they're oftentimes not as screwed up as they think they are. Yeah. And I might have a lot to learn from you as the patient in quotations, you know, maybe this appointment is more about you teaching me. <laughs> well, a, a, a big part of being a good clinician is just listening to the, to the individual's body. Yeah. There, there's so much that you get from empiricism in terms of, you know, what did you do? How yeah. did you feel? Gluten is a great example of that. And most diets you have to have the person experiment and read their, their biofeedback to know if that is or isn't a good idea. So it's, it's an excellent point that um, <laughs> you have to listen. There, someone said this. I don't, I don't recall who it Probably is, but, Watts. But yeah, probably Watts <laughs> who said, you know, listen to your patients. They will give you the answer. And I think there's a lot to that. Right. 100%. And it might not be in, in their words per se. Yeah. You know? Sometimes it's just how they, how they answer a question. Yeah. How is your bloating? And they talk for 18 minutes. It's yeah, like, like oh, you're thinking okay, about bloating too great, much, great, great, <laughs> you know. Great. Or how much are you wrapped up in your story? Like, yeah. how much are you feeling, and how much are you just just regurgitating story from some other clinician? Yeah, and that we do a lot of kind of reprogramming on that. Like I said earlier, probably 30 percent of the time, sadly, we're talking someone out of a problem I think they have. Mm -hmm. And then who are you without your problem? Yeah, yeah. You know, if you've identified with that for 25 years. Yep imagine who you'd be without that. That might be terrifying. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a much harder ball of yarn to unravel, but that, that is where things like limbic retraining, I think, can be really helpful for these people. Yeah. But yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of work to do. In some ways, I think it almost feels safer to come back on the, to the statistics and the, the drugs that we can put into a bottle and all that because it's very materialistic, linear, like, boom, here's the solution. It's like, ah. Oh. But then when you get into those bigger, broader conversations and the ball of yarn starts kind of spooling out, you know, it's like, whoa, what are we dealing with here? There's a well, lot of layers yeah, to it, I th think. That's, that's why I, I do think the optimum balance is a union between conventional medicine and alternative and integrative medicine because the way of thinking tends to be different. Integrative and alternative medicine is much more kind of cross systems and looking at all these various domains yeah. and conventional medicine wants to drill deeper down. I mean, for the most part, I'm painting with a little bit of a broad brush here, but they're, they're trying to reduce things down to components so they can say, well, if you have this family history finding and you're this old and you have these symptoms, you have this percentage chance of colorectal cancer. And we know screening at this frequency reduces your risk of late diagnosis by 70%. Yeah. So that, that's a whole discipline in and of itself, and that's great, and we want that. But that's going to use up so much bandwidth that the, well, could the chronic bloating be from the fact that you're eating a ton of FODMAPs and sitting all day? That's a different way of thinking, yeah. right? And so I, I don't, and I'm not insinuating that you said this, but I don't think it's, you know, choose one or the other. It's a pairing no. of the two. It's you know, the same chicken or the egg Yeah, let, let's live as much as we can in, in the integrative space so that when we go for the checkout in the conventional space, there's nothing there to look at, yeah. but don't throw any one out because uh, both together are probably the, the best path forward. Yeah. But when you live in a world that's, that's you know, like the medium is the message is a, is a, a nice idea, Marshall McLuhan, where it's like the, the medium in which we are inhabiting ourselves in being, you know, literally like media, you know, uh, we're, we're on our cell phones and computer and advertisements and, you know, we're, we're exposed to so much throughout the day. I think that that informs the way that we, we process ourselves and process thoughts and ideas and the echo chambers that we exist in and the polarizations of, you know, our camp, that camp, we're right, they're wrong, all that. It almost, it's like the medium that we live in almost forms us or, 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 or creates a bias towards separation in a way. You know what I'm saying? I think I'm kind of getting out there a little bit, but separation from one another, separation Separ from like the camp just of dualism medicine. in general. Yeah. So, so as opposed to being able to lean on both sides, saying, "Oh man, I think 
those vegans, they're they're onto something. And oh, I think those paleo and the carnivore, I think they're onto something. Oh, sure. Similar sure. thing from like like a metaphysical perspective. Oh, the the talk therapist, I think they're onto something. Oh, the functional medicine person that's really deep in the reason, I think they're onto something. As opposed to being like, oh, it's just this side, it's just this side. Oh, yeah. you're just you're just, it's all in your head. It's yeah. like, well, yes, and it's it's also maybe yeah. you know some probiotics. It, it, it's a very interesting kind of. Uh, I guess it's almost like an ontological question of where belief systems come from, but you're right. And you will see some people who they really have a hard time thinking outside of their camp. And I'm sure you see, you know, you'll see people, um, someone may have given like a great lecture at Stanford, let's say some professor or something, and someone will have a snide remark, you know, big pharma's funding all this. And it's like, well, just take it easy. Um, and, right. and, and there are, right, that's a fair criticism in some contexts, but, the point I'm making to sharpen it up a little bit is you'll see someone who seems overly vindictive against a certain camp of thought. And that's a reflection of, I think people who have just gotten too siloed into a certain way of thinking mm -hmm. and it, that can be really unhealthy. And that's one of the things I think that um, social media and just more time kind of getting ingrained in certain information silos is not, is not helping us. So it just maybe a plug for putting your phone down and talking to the person next to you in, in line next time. Yeah. Where do people go? Oh. People got to go find your shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm at uh, drrusho.com, which is uh, D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O.com. And the clinic is the Austin Center for Functional Medicine. I have a book, Healthy Gut, Healthy You, even though I ragged on people for trying to sell books earlier. I have a book, but the book is meant to walk you through all this stuff. So it starts off with diet and lifestyle and, and kind of how to navigate through you know, are you sleeping enough? And what does your diet look like? And, and so the book's kind of like a self-help guide for applying many of these concepts that we discussed. Uh, and that's kind of the lion's share of it um, between, you know, the website and the clinic. Um, oh, and I do have some dietary supplements. So we have a line of uh, probiotics and hypoallergenic meal replacements, mainly catered around people who have really sensitive digestion so they can kind of do this meal replacement to... Um, almost do a fast for their gut uh, because the nutrition is pre-digested. It's known as an elemental diet. Yeah, and that's uh, pretty much the, the lion's share. I really appreciate being able to come on here and talk about gut health because for me, if I didn't get thrown the lifeline when I was in college, I probably would have walked around as a mess for many years. So I'm, I'm mm. really thankful that from you know falling apart to at least finding the functional medicine field and, and getting on the road to help was only six months because there are some people that we'll see, you know, again at the office that have been flattering for a long time. And it's, it is kind of crazy to see someone who's been suffering for years and in three months be able to take that away. And that's not every case, right? I don't want to, you know, proclaim that we're miracle workers or anything like that, but it is pretty cool to be able to, to see that. Like, gosh, you've been dealing with brain fog, insomnia, abdominal pain for three years. And then in three months it's gone. So that's why I'm so passionate about just getting that message out for, like, I understand there's all this cool stuff that when you type in your symptoms, you know, it's like, here's a personalized seven reasons why it's your thyroid article. Yeah. But if, if you haven't stopped into Gutville and you've already gone through diet and lifestyle town, sorry for the terrible analogy here, no, okay. um, you know, make, make sure you stop there next because there, there's a good chance that the answer an individual needs is, is found therein. And that's not just something that is my own position. The other doctors in our center find the same thing and we're, we're publishing case studies, you know, illustrating this person was incorrectly diagnosed, let's say as hypothyroid is one case study and they, they've been on thyroid medication for a year and a half and they know better. And we undiagnosed their incorrect diagnosis. We took some steps to improve their gut health. And three months later, the suffering from the past year and a half is gone. Yeah. So it's when I see things like that that make me passionate. I, you know, I don't mean to be overly critical about people being misdiagnosed because I'm sure providers aren't trying to misdiagnose people. But nonetheless, you know, when someone cries because they say, Jesus, I feel like I wasted the past year and a half, you know, it motivates you to kind of get the word out there. So sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm monologuing. No, now, that's great. But um, that's, you know, that's where I am on the internet. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. What's, what's, your, what's your itch? It's uh, D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O. Perfect. There may be a period in there. Sure, people probably just we give, we have all this stuff. I think people just go to Instagram, and then from there, whatever links in your thing is probably the direction people go. We're visual creatures. Yeah, it won't be too hard to find me. Not too hard. All right.
Thank you, man. Thank you, sir. Appreciate, Appreciate making the time. All right. Yeah, Thank you all for tuning in. Over now. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. If you did, we greatly appreciate reviews anywhere you're listening to this too, iTunes, Spotify, whatever. Telling your friends is so darn supportive. And if there's a particular part that you liked, por favor, share that little mofo on the Instagram. And there's a good chance that either myself or Dr. Ruscio will repost. Love seeing the parts that you guys enjoy. You can tag me at Align Podcast and you can tag Dr. Ruscio at Dr. Ruscio. So D-R Ruscio. It's Ruscio spelled R. R-U-S-C-I-O. Also, if you guys are experiencing any type of joint pain per mention during the episode, I think that a great place to look at is what's happening within your gut. Also, other places to look at would be stress levels in your life. And a part of those stress levels would be mechanical stress levels. So if you're using your body in an inefficient way, you're creating impingement in various different joints throughout the system, and that will create stress and inflammation. And this is exactly why we created the six-week Align Method online program. We break down week by week, step by step, how you can start to work with yourself. So we teach you the fundamentals of what you need to know about self-care practices, fundamentals of what you need to know about breathing practices to either upregulate your nervous system or calm your nervous system down, and the fundamentals of moving more effectively. So in your daily life, every moment is an opportunity to become stronger, more flexible, more confident, and cultivate your own longevity. Our bodies are not built to break down. We were just never taught how to move in such a way that is restorative in our daily life. We also include various different yoga flows and movement flows in there as well. So a lot of times people ask me questions about how to integrate more creativity and dynamic movement into their workouts. They kind of get stuck doing the same old routine. We incorporate some creative ideas in there for you also. So check that out over at alignpodcast.com slash courses. And once again, like everything else, if you're not totally satisfied with your experience, if you do not get what you wanted out of that program, we too offer you a 100% money back guarantee. So if you are not totally, completely satisfied with the program, it does not change your life, then hit us up. No questions asked. We got your back. And I hope you guys enjoy that. So go over to alignpodcast.com slash courses to start improving the way that you think, feel, and move.